section. Today we're going to look at the book of Ezekiel. A very, uh, perhaps an obscure book, perhaps you haven't spent a lot of time there. A lot of imagery, a lot of death and destruction and doom. But we're going to look at Ezekiel today and we're going to try and figure out what Ezekiel's about and what Ezekiel's saying. So I'm not going to cover the whole book, I'm going to cover just a few verses, but it's going to give you an idea of what Ezekiel's doing. Now you may be asking yourself, Who's this guy, Ezekiel? Who's this guy, Ezekiel? He's not a surf clothing line from the 90s, by the way. <laughs> Is it the 90s? Was it? I can't remember. By the way, what do you call the 2000s? Like, what do we call the years 0, 1 through 0, 9? Do we call the, the aughts? The aughts? They're the aughts? Okay. And what do we call the tens that we're in now? Do we call these the teens? I don't know. Once we get to the 20s, I got it. I got that. But I don't know what we call these early years in the 21st century. But they seem to all run together to me. Maybe I'm getting older. So, um, the book of Ezekiel is written for a time like we're in. And you may ask yourself, well, I don't get it. You know, the book of Ezekiel is written for a time 3,000 some odd years ago. The Israelites were in captivity in Babylon. And we're going to we'll talk about that. But it's written for us today. So none ever lose track of that. So how do we find the book of Ezekiel? Maybe some of you haven't been there before. It's okay. Um, first of all, just open your Bible up to the halfway point. You should land somewhere in the book of Psalms. Okay, and then if we turn to the right, you'll work through the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. You'll find yourself in Jeremiah, and then you'll find yourself in... Jeremiah's Lamentations, and then you'll find yourself in Ezekiel. Um, if you've been keeping up with your Bible reading plan that we have here, um, you'll find yourself in the mornings or in the evenings whenever you read about three quarters of the way through the book of Ezekiel. And you'll, be find, you'll probably be asking yourself, what is going on in this book? Because it is a crazy book. What's this old man going on about, and what does it have to do with me? Hopefully we're going to answer those questions. Um, Ezekiel is one of the major prophets, okay, and there are other minor prophets. If you keep your thumb in Ezekiel and you go to the table of contents and you look there, you can look at the prophets. And what you'll see is the major prophets are known as Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And that's because they have larger books. And then you have all the minors after them. You have Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. A lot of you guys interested in Bible names, you want to name your kids Bible names, pick one of those. Um, now don't think for a minute that there are major prophets and they're very important and then there's these guys in AAA in the minors that aren't as important. Each one of these guys is important. Each one of these guys was selected, chosen by God and given what's called a burden. God laid a burden on their back and they had to carry it to the people. That was God's message or His Word. We're given God's Word today in our Bibles, by the way. They didn't have these back then. This, the, God was, the Word was spoken to the prophets and the prophets would take it to the people. Okay? So, um, why do we look at these Old Testament guys? Oh, by the way, there's some other prophets. I should mention them. They're not just those. There's Samuel, right? You guys know Samuel, right? We're talking about him as Brian's going through the book of First and Second Samuel. There's Elisha and Elijah, or Elijah and Elisha. They're found in First and Second Kings. They're prophets. They're Moses, you can consider him a prophet. Even as far back as Genesis, we have Abraham. We have, excuse me, we have Enoch, Noah, Abraham. Um, and uh, Jacob and Joseph. All those can be considered prophets too. So there are prophets throughout the Old Testament just because they don't have a book doesn't mean they don't, they're not prophets. By the way, who was the last Old Testament prophet? Malachi. Malachi was the last book but John the Baptist was considered the last Old Testament prophet. He is the one that ushers in Jesus Christ. Here was John the Baptist's message. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Isaiah said of John, 
Isaiah foretold John's coming. He is the voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the, to prepare the way for the Lord and make paths straight for him. So John the Baptist kind of closes the book on Old Testament prophets. And so why do we look at these guys? I mean, they're over 3,000 years old, some of these guys. How can they ever apply to what we're experiencing today, what we're doing today? I mean, they didn't even have faxes or pagers back then. Okay, that, that joke fell flat, but you know, faxes and pagers are already gone, right? I mean, we're so far in the modern world, we're post-post-modern. We've left it all behind, right? I mean, how do these guys that walked around in funny robes and turbans apply to us? We study these guys, we study these Old Testament prophets because they foretold Jesus Christ. They came before him. Their view of Christ was looking forward to him. As we look at Christ, we look back at him. We read his gospels. We look at the history of his ministry and we see him moving and acting. And act. They didn't see any of that. That was all a shadow to them. They hadn't seen that yet. What they had seen was just the visions and the words that God had given them and they knew something was coming. Something bigger than them, something that they needed and that their people needed drastically because they were separated from God and here was going to come the Messiah, the one that would usher in the kingdom of God. And here even John the Baptist says, the very last one, the kingdom of God is near. And less than three days later, he would show up at, his, at the Jordan and John would baptize him. Ezekiel himself was given a very undesirable task. Ezekiel was asked to speak to a broken people. A little history here. So, the Jewish people were a great nation. David had become king. Brian's talking about David as, the, as king, right? He's becoming king, right? So, David's kingdom would become great and its borders would increase to the greatest amount ever under uh, the kingdom of, uh, under, uh, under a king, and that's just how big Israel would be. Then Solomon would become king after him, and Solomon would amass great wealth and great wisdom. And then after Solomon, we have kind of a great breakup, okay? And the kingdom becomes split into two, Israel, the northern kingdom, and then Judah. And then they kind of tussle with each other, they tussle with their neighbors, and they fall into some just great idolatry. And when I mean idolatry, I mean they worshipped other gods. They didn't worship the God that they knew that history and their forefathers had all told them had established them as a great nation. They worshipped other gods. One of which, I'll give you an example, one of which was a guy named Molech. And we really don't, you know, we, we really can't even imagine what Molech was like today. But one of the um, traditions or one of the ceremonies of Molech was to sacrifice not bunny rabbits, not goats, not anything like that, but your own children to Molech. So the Israelites were taking part in these activities. So you see how far afield Israel had fallen. And Isaiah would come on the scene, and later Jeremiah, these two prophets, and they would predict or they would foretell of Israel's captivity. Israel would fall to the Assyrians, and later Judah and fallen Israel would fall to the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar, the great king Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to read about him a little bit today, would take Israel captive into the land. He would take them off into Babylon. That's about where Iraq is now, by the way. So he'd carry off the choicest individuals. So he just imagine he would come to the Bay Area and he'd take away all the... C++ programmers, or all the guys that knew Java, and he took them all away and left the rest of us for scraps. And he and, and uh, left a few tenant farmers in the land. So, now this is where Ezekiel comes on the scene. As a matter of fact, when you open up the book of Ezekiel, you go, he's, in the, he's like in the river of Euphrates. And it's kind of a strange scene. And you're like, what's going on here? Well, the river Euphrates is not in the land of Israel. 
He's stuck over there and because they've been strewn out across the Arabian Peninsula as they've been dragged off to Babylon. And here he is with them. And he's going to prophesy to this broken people. Most of Ezekiel's message is one of judgment and destruction for Israel and its neighbors. He has a lot of messages for his neighbors, by the way, and they're put in there so that we can see, uh, you know, what, how much God loves Israel. You mess with Israel, I'm going to mess with you, just so you know. So when you go and three, read through Israel, and he, I mean, excuse me, Ezekiel, and he says, messages for uh, Tyre and others, that is to show us how much God loves Israel. And in effect, how much he loves us. You mess with my people, I'm going to mess with you, is what he's saying. Today we're going to look at one of Ezekiel's messages that has a glimmer of hope for that vast wasteland of misery. And we'll start with Ezekiel chapter 5, and we'll go through verses 1 and 3. And you, son of man, this is the Lord talking to Israel, take a sharp sword. Take a barber's razor and pass it over your head and your beard. Then take scales and weigh and divide the hair. You shall burn with fire one-third in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are finished. <clears throat> then you shall take one-third and strike it around with the sword, and one-third you shall scatter in the wind. And I will draw out a sword after them. And you will also take a small number of them and bind them in the edge of your garment. So Ezekiel was to take his hair and shave his head. Now Ezekiel, it's, it, they were given instructions on what to do with their hair, the holy men of Israel. And they, it was, they were not to cut it. They were not to, so now to cut your hair would be to take on great shame. And God's saying, you know what Ezekiel, you're going to take on great shame. You're going to shave your head. And you're going to take your hair and you're going to divide it into three parts. I'll go over those three parts briefly. But Ezekiel, this is what I'm going to do to the nation of Israel. It's going to take on great shame. It's going to be divided into three parts. One part is going to be burned up in the city. Jerusalem is going to be laid siege to. And it's going to be destroyed. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Braveheart. Well, there's a pretty eerie scene in there where they, they get this big siege works and they ram the gates right and then they take the city and uh, you can just imagine what that's like and in this case they kill all those that they find and then they burn it to the ground kind of makes 9-11 look a little innocent in some ways another third is going to scatter they're going to run to the winds and they're going to be chased down with the sword. Another third is going to be scattered. And then there's going to be a little part of that third that gets tucked away in the edge of the garment. The Lord's garment. Let's look at Ezekiel 6. And it, <clears throat> we'll talk. God's going to give it a little more language here. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesies against them and say now he's looking west because he's far east of Israel at this point he's looking west O mountains of Israel hear the word of the Lord of God thus says the Lord God to the mountains to the hills to the ravines and to the valleys indeed even I will bring the sword against you and I will destroy your high places the high places where they were are where they committed their acts of idolatry by the way I will destroy your high places. Then your altars shall be desolate. Your incense altars shall be broken. And I will cast down your slain men before your idols. And I will lay corpses of the children of Israel before their idols. And I will scatter your bones all around the altars. In all your dwelling places the city shall be laid waste. And the high places shall be desolate. So that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate. Your idols may be broken and made to cease, your incense altars may be cut down, and your works may be abolished. The slain shall fall in your midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Yet, I will leave a remnant, 
so that you may have some who escape the sword among the nations. And when you are scattered throughout the countries, then those of you who escape will remember me, that's God, and um, among the nations where they are carried captive because I was crushed by their adulterous heart which has departed from me and by the eyes which play the harlot after idols. And they will loathe themselves for the evils which they committed in all their abominations and God says this several times in the book of Ezekiel. And they shall know that I am the Lord, and I have not said it, I have, and I have not said in vain that I would bring this calamity upon them. This is the Lord's doing, okay? The Lord of love, the, you know, the God of love and peace and happiness that we're all looking for, that we're all seeking so sensitively. This is the Lord's doing. Israel was given this warning. Moses gave it to him. Hey, follow me. Don't follow the idols of the nations around you or this is what's going to happen. And God's good on his word. God keeps his promises, which is a good thing if you love God and you follow him. It's not such a great thing if you don't, if you're disobedient, you fall away from him. The word I want to look at here is in verse 8. Verse 8 of chapter 6. Yet I will leave a remnant that's the title of my message today, Remnant. We're going to find all about, all about this remnant today. The word remnant in Hebrew means to be left behind. It's to, to remain, to spare. It's a remainder of. It's a smaller part of a larger. It's a smaller part often of lesser quality. Whose quality are we talking about here? Man's quality. What we would value as high quality often of a lesser quality is what the remnant is made up of. Those that are forgotten, left behind, not considered, overlooked. And, and throughout the Bible, they're seen as survivors. Ezekiel refers to the remnant again in um, chapter 7, verses 16 through 18, as survivors. Those who survive will escape and be on the mountains like doves of the valleys. All of them mourning, each for his iniquity. Every hand will be feeble. Every knee will be as weak as water. And they will also uh, they will also be girded with sackcloth. Horror will cover them. Shame will be on their face. Baldness on their heads. What Ezekiel is describing there is a great picture of repentance. They know that they've sinned. They know that they're in this spot because of their own misdeeds, their own misgivings, and they're aware of that. God sees them as mourning doves. Interesting that he uses doves there. You know, he doesn't use the word crow there, right? He uses doves. It's a bird of peace. Whenever you see a dove in the Bible, it's a symbol of peace. Okay? Ambassadors of peace is what he, God sees them as. That that God only, that He only has spared and that He will preserve and sustain for a very special purpose. So this remnant. Now that we know what it is, what's it doing? God is always working. I want you to know that God's always working. God's busy right now working. Okay? He works in the big stuff, obviously, right? We know that. Earthquakes. We, we can read the book of Revelation. We can, we can find all these big, big dramatic scenes in the Bible. He parts the Red Sea. God's working. But I want to make sure you understand that God works in the remnant. God works in the ragtag bunch that's left behind. This concept, is a very, this concept of remnant might be foreign or strange to you and me. See, we live in the 21st century. I kind of referred to that earlier. We live in the big and the bold, right? We just had the iPhone 6 launch. We have, we have things nowadays that are so big, we call them launches. Oracle has a conference, and it's a big Oracle Fest. Or I don't even know what it's called. I forget. So we have all these, you know, we just had the opening of NFL season, right? And this year we're going to have college playoffs. That's the NCAA Division I is actually going to have a college playoff for the first time in my life. That's pretty exciting stuff, right? Big, bold. That's how we work. We work in the lofty rhetoric of political campaigns. 
It seems like every time I get up here, it's, it's not often, but every time up here, we're in the midst of an election season. It just seems that way. I don't know what, I don't know what God's doing with that. I don't know what, he, what he's saying, but, but, but we're in the midst of an election year. It's, it, now it's off cycle a little, but, but, but you can just imagine the lofty rhetoric is about to begin. Guard your phones, you know, skip the commercials, just tape the thing on TiVo and go over them because it's going to come at you. You'll hear all sorts of promises that will never be fulfilled. That's what we work in, okay? The headlines of the media, the shock and awe of war, all these things are big and bold, and that's just all we get all day long. That's what we receive. Oh, I like, got to get more of it. Psst, sit on my phone, look at that. Oh, 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 look, what's the news? What's the news? I can't. Okay. But God doesn't work that way. God's busy right now working in the remnant. Working in all the stuff that's overlooked. All the stuff that gets forgotten about. All the stuff that gets left behind. He's working. And we're going to see that God is at work. He hasn't forgotten those things. I don't even think he had the iPhone 6 thing on his calendar, by the way. Mm -hmm. But anyway. So what would become of this remnant? This remnant that gets carried off into Babylon. And I'll spend a little bit of time here, hopefully, uh, for those of you, um, you, some of you may know the history, some of you may not. This remnant will be cared for greatly. It would be cared for greatly, protected against all foes and forces. It would even prosper and represent God well to an unbelieving, corrupt, and opulent culture. Off into Babylon. Okay? We... <laughs> They, you think Israel's neighbors have strange gods? They got stranger ones. Okay? So, and they got multiple gods. And, and matter of fact, they even worshipped their own king as a god. Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? So, and yet, God's going to prosper this remnant. And we'll look at a couple examples. Consider Daniel and his three friends. Hananiah, Mishael, and Ariziah. These guys were part of the choice pieces of Israel that were carted off to Babylon and then trained to be servants and advisors to King, to King Nebuchadnezzar. The same king that left the carcasses of all their brothers in the fields to be eaten by the birds. These four young men resolved in the uh, NIV, it says, purposed in their hearts. I like, that's, that's a good definition of what resolve means. Have you ever resolved anything? Have you ever purposed anything in your heart? They purposed in their hearts not to defile themselves with the royal food and wine. And Daniel asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. That's in chapter 1 of Daniel. I think that reference is up there, is it? Yeah. Okay. You see, the delicacies of the king, the meat and the wine found in Babylon, were ceremonially tied to Babylonian idols. And these four young men would have nothing of it. Forget, just for a moment, if you know the story, they go on to say, we'll take vegetables and water instead. And for, forget the whole vegetarian joke here for a second. They were not going to allow... Um, the defiles of the, de they weren't going to defile themselves with the delicacies of the king. They just weren't going to allow it. F forget the vegetables and water. They could have been killed for this. They're, you're, they're putting food before their, and they're saying, no, thank you. And this food has been taken and been used in ceremonies to Babylonian idols. And they're saying, no, we don't want it because we don't recognize your gods. We don't recognize your idols. Sorry. This, could, this is highly offensive to the Babylonians. And yet, they took a stand on this issue. What was the, they could have been killed for their obstinacy. What was the result? God granted them favor with the king's official. And as they continued in this obedience, they didn't give up on it. They continued in it. God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And here, I'll skip to the chase. When it came time for the selection, King Nebuchadnezzar found none equal to them. In every matter of wisdom understanding about which the king questioned him, he found them ten times better than all the other magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Servant boys from Israel take over. What would the headline be? 
Would that be a headline, servant boys from Israel take over king's court? Would we have that? And how did they do it? They ate vegetables. No, what you have here is young men who know the Word of God, who know what God's commands are. They know His promises and they say, we're going to stand pat on Him. We're going to follow Him. Despite all this junk that's going on around us, we're not going to put up with it. And what happens? God rewards them. You ever been in a spot like that? You ever been hanging with your buddies? And, you know, hey, let's go clubbing or whatever it is. Or you ever been at work and around the water cooler and all sorts of junks being talked about and you're gonna say, you know what, I'm not gonna participate. I'm not gonna get involved in that. That's what these guys did. It's a little bit more dramatic, obviously, right? But this is the same effort that they put forth. We're not gonna take part in that. This guy, Daniel himself, you can read the book, it's a fascinating book, by the way. Daniel would go on to serve several more Babylonian kings. He would interpret more dreams and signs. One of those dreams, would save King Nebuchadnezzar's life. Uh, excuse me, would save, uh, excuse me, not Nebuchadnezzar's life, all the advisors of King Nebuchadnezzar's lives. So in other words, all the pagan advisors that uh, would later try to kill Daniel, by the way, but we'll skip that for now. All the pagan advisors that were advising King Nebuchadnezzar were about to be killed because they couldn't interpret a dream, and Nebuchadnezzar interprets it. And he saves not only himself, not only Shaq, Rish, uh, uh, um, Shaq, Rack, and Benny, but he saves um, these guys too, okay? God uses them to save Babylonians here. Okay, um, he would go on to interpret another dream that would send Nebuchadnezzar raving mad into the, into the wilderness and then have him come back. Another predicted the demise of Nebuchadnezzar's son and another of the coming of Christ and would give him more and more visions and even to the great extent that they would predict the blueprint for end times. That's what God would use Daniel to do. All because God said, you know what, I'm going to, all because Daniel, excuse me, said, I'm going to follow what God has commanded me to do. I'm going to take a stand. It started with vegetables and water and not taking on the meat. And then it went on and on and on. And he continued to take a stand for what the Lord wanted him to do, what the Lord put on his heart to do. And God bless them each time. These guys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azira, they're more commonly referred to by their Babylonian titles. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you're a VeggieTales fan, that's Rack, Shack, and Benny. Okay, so these guys, these guys is a great Bible story. I know everybody who went to Sunday school got this Bible story. Um, they would refuse to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image of gold. They refused to bow to it. The trumpet would play, ah, we're not going to do that. Listen to how this went. We'll pick up the story. If you want to turn to Daniel 3, we'll pick it up in verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar hears about this and he says to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my advisors, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. That would be a good thing, guys. I recommend it. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Is the world doing that to you right now? Hey, when the, f when, when the music comes on, when the lights come on, are they saying, hey, worship our gods? Listen to what their answers are. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, I can just hear their tactful prose here, in their, their tactful sound of their voice. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blurning, blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But wait, but wait, listen to this part. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. <laughs> 
Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual, and he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command, Nebuchadnezzar's command, was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers, killed the pagan soldiers who took up Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, and these men firmly tied and fell, these men were firmly tied and fell into the blazing furnace. What did God do? What happened? There's, you know, I love this part because God doesn't really delay it for us. We don't have to go to commercial or anything. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, Your Majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. I love that expression. I love that he uses the expression, the Son of God. Because the guy walking around in the fire, by the way, is the Son of God. That's Jesus Christ walking around the fire, by the way. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of who? Servants of the Most High God. Come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the sap traps, it's a great name for them, by the way, perfectors, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them, and they saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed, their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. You ever been near a fire, and you know, you, you can just smell your clothes kind of starting to get singy a little bit? Nothing. These guys have been in it, right? By the way, praise God, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When I get to heaven, one of the first guys I want to meet is King Nebuchadnezzar. And there's other evidence in the book of Daniel that he will be there. Babylonian king, pagan, not a Jew, ter a terrible Gentile like myself, he's in heaven, and I can't wait to meet him. Who else was part of this remnant in Babylon? Queen Esther. Who studied the book of Esther? It's a great little book. It's a great little book. Something I learned about Esther this week, God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. Did you know that? I didn't know that. His, you know, his name, Jehovah or el Homin, it's not mentioned. But you can see God's handiwork all over it, right? The book of Esther. Esther is an orphan Jewish girl raised by her cousin Mordecai. Mordecai is of the tribe of Benjamin. He's part of the remnant that's been taken off to Babylon. By the way, that's Paul's tribe also, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. King Xerxes would select Esther to be the new queen. She and Mordecai would save Xerxes from a plot to kill him from within his own ranks so other Babylonians wanting to kill a Babylonian, actually they're Medes, excuse me, other Medes wanting to kill a Mede. The Medes had taken over by now. Then God would use them again in even greater fashion to save the Jewish race, to save the remnant from total destruction. Ezra, the book of Ezra, if you want to look that up sometime, the book of Ezra is about a guy who was in the remnant. God moved on King Cyrus's heart, King Cyrus is later, Okay, God moved on King Cyrus' heart to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem. And he would select Ezra to take a ragtag band of the remnant back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Nehemiah was part of the remnant. It's another great book. It's another great book for men. It's a good book for women too, but if you're a guy, you should really read Nehemiah. It's just an awesome book. There's one scene in it where... Nehemiah says, you know what, we're not going to let these guys mess with us. He's got them working with a trowel in one hand. So he's got a trowel and he's got a weapon in the other. So here you are, you got a power tool in one hand and you got your sword in the other. Tell me what guy doesn't like that story, right? Okay. Mm. <laughs> Distraction there, sorry. Okay, so Nehemiah was part of the rep bearer. You know what Nehemiah was before he went back to the land? He was the cup bearer to the king. He was the cup bearer to King Xerxes. And he was so burdened with the state of Jerusalem and their broken walls that 
He fasted and mourned and prayed for many days. And God would answer those prayers by granting Nehemiah favor with the king. And in turn, the king would send Nehemiah back to the land with everything he needed. That's a neat study sometime. All the things that Nehemiah needed to go back. He needed a safe passage. He needed a bunch of wood. Everything. You know, you know, to rebuild the walls. And Nehemiah and his crew would overcome great opposition to rebuild the walls of that great city. That's all part of the remnant that's taken off into Babylon. All those guys that were tucked in the cloak. Those little hairs that were tucked in the cloak, that were protected, that were preserved, that were prospered in a corrupt and opulent culture. Even after God returns them to the land, the remnant would be used. All the way into the New Testament. Now Judah, the nation, just a little more history here, Judah the nation would never rise to the power it once was, but God would continue to use the remnant to bring about His plan and purpose. Dick mentioned that the last Old Testament prophet is Malachi. He's the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. From Malachi to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, we have 400 years of silence. What's God doing in these 400 years? He's not talking to anybody. There's no prophets. There's no nothing. Nothing's going on, right? But yet, God is using a remnant. And we find as we open up the first few pages of the Gospel of Matthew, we find Mary and Joseph, part of the remnant, being obedient to what God is going to ask them to do. Both by the line of David, by the way, Mary and Joseph are, out of the tribe of Judah. Early on in Luke's Gospel, very early on in Luke's Gospel, we find another couple that's part of the remnant, Elizabeth and Zacharias, or Zechariah, depending on which, verse you, which version you have. Both old and faithful to God, but God uses them to bring into time a guy named John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet. And this John the Baptist would be the one who would prepare the way for his cousin, Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, God with us, our Lord and Savior. Jesus would increase. Jesus' ministry would increase and John's ministry would decrease. John's ministry would decrease so great, it would decrease to the point of being beheaded in a dungeon to save Herod's honor and to satisfy Herod's wife's hatred. By world standards, John the Baptist's ministry is an abysmal failure. There's no headline about that. He's, forgot, he's a forgotten babbler of the Jewish race. But by Jesus' standards, look how Jesus described John the Baptist. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. That's all of us in here and all of us ever born, John the Baptist, the greatest. Jesus himself, he even experienced this loneliness of the resume, right? We see these scenes of Jesus gathering these great crowds, particularly when he feeds them. You ever notice that? There's a scene in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John where Jesus gives a very difficult message. It's highlighted by this interchange here. Where John, where in ver, verse 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us flesh to eat? Give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, hearing these words, Mumblings. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. What's the eating flesh and drinking blood stuff? Skip down to verse 60. On hearing this, many of His disciples said, This is hard teaching. Who can accept it? And from in verse 66 says, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer filed, f followed him. So Jesus presents this hard message that we need to partake of his body and his blood because that's going to be sacrificed for us. It's a picture of the sacrifice of the Old Testament. Do you see that? He's the 
He's the unspotted lamb, the great sacrifice that reconciles all of mankind to God. And you've got to partake in that to participate in it. And that's what Christ is saying here, but they don't get it. They're dull, as we heard earlier, right? They're dull. By the way, you Bible conspiracists, you, you Bible coders, I wanted you to notice something about this, just a little distraction here. John 6, 66, 666. Okay, we, we won't go there, but just that's, that's the verse here that says, from this time on, many of his disciples turned back. Maybe that means something. I don't know. It's just a coincidence, but I think it's pretty interesting. And only a handful of disciples would remain. That remnant. One of them, one of that handful would go on to betray Jesus. We know that story. And the others would abandon him altogether. Even John, the guy who writes the gospel all about the Garden of Gethsemane there, they would abandon Jesus, the king of the universe, in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was carried off by a band of thugs and cowards under cover of darkness. The best description, I think, is in Mark, where I think Mark actually includes himself as following this band and then being stripped naked and running away. I mean, that's all of us, right? That we, all of us would run away at the, the, the threat of our own lives here, right? The examples go on of the remnant, of this remnant throughout the New Testament. The early church was persecuted and scattered at the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr. That's in Acts 7 and 8. In Acts 8, we're introduced to a guy named Saul who approved of this stoning. He would later encounter the risen Christ and he would become part of this remnant. He would later be abandoned by his folks. Demas, a, a very faithful brother of his, would abandon him for the world. That's in 2 Timothy 4. In fact, history tells us about the apostles that they would all die pretty gruesome deaths for the gospel, with the exception of John, who was exiled on the island of Patmos. Perhaps they couldn't kill him. God had to use him to write another book called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, so I've gone on about it. Okay, Rich, we get it. There's this remnant. God works through it. I get it. All right, you don't have to go on. I know you're excited about it, Rich, but what's, what's it got to do with me, right? What's it got to do with today, with the iPhone 6 launch? I don't get it. Well, if you're like me, before we say what's it got to do with me or today, I want to know why. Why does God work through the remnant? Why would he do that? I mean, if it were up to me, I, you know, I'd do it in the big and the bold. I'd just, hey, boom, take over. That's God. I would wrap everything around and, and be the control freak that I love to be. But that's not how God works. Oh, he's in control. Don't forget that. But God's working through the remnant because if he worked through the big and the bold and through all of our ways, then we'd think it's us. Then we, mankind would think it's man and not God. And God works through the remnant so he knows that it's all of him and none of you. All of him and none of them. God doesn't roll that way. He doesn't rule that way. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. So what's it got to do with today? Let me show you what God is doing right now. There's a little verse in 2 Corinthians, I mean, 2 Chronicles, excuse me, verse 16, 9. It goes like this. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. See, God's doing, right now, he's doing what he's always been doing. Look at Daniel. Little slave boy in a foreign land just to says, you know, I'm not going to participate. I'm not going to defile myself. God sees that. I'm going to show myself strong to him. Look at Rakshak and Benny. God sees it. I'm not going to show, I'm going to show myself strong to them. Look at all the characters of the Old Testament that God comes in full force for. They're loyal to him and he's loyal to them. Right now God's doing the same thing. He's looking out for those who are loyal to Him. Those who have pledged their allegiance. Pledged their allegiance to Him and His cause. You could put it this way. God's eyes are fixed on those of us 
those of you, those men and women whose eyes are fixed on him or fixed on Jesus. I think that says it somewhere in the Bible. On those who aren't looking at their past, they aren't looking at the things around them and letting those things influence them, but they're looking forward to the cross and not turning back. God's looking at and working through his remnant, tucked away in the hem of his garment, protecting and preserving and prospering. What a great place to be. Here's how Paul describes the remnant. He describes them as more than conquerors through him, through God who loved us. And here's what Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The remnant is the church, the body of Christ, and that's what God is doing. He's preserving it. He's protecting it. He's not letting anything come against it. You may not feel that way. You might feel right now that the whole world is against you. You might look and say, you know what? Here we are, 50 or so folks on a Sunday morning. The world's out there doing whatever it wants to do today. And what's going on? Well, God's working right now, right here in this very room, working through the remnant. He's working through the remnant, reconciling mankind to Him. He's providing a way to get mankind to Him. Mankind that's fallen away, that's forgotten about Him, that doesn't care about Him, He's working through this remnant to do that. Listen to how Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, that's Jesus, died for all, and therefore all died. And He died for all that those who should live no longer live for themselves, but who died for them and was raised again. Did it look like Daniel was living for himself? Didn't look like it to me. Okay. So far from now, so, so from, excuse me, excuse me, verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we no longer do so. I remember those days. When I thought of Christ as kind of this great teacher, and I was such a Academic. I was so intellectual. I thought, oh, he's, he's up there with Buddha and Gandhi. He's cool, you know. Not at all. He's God, right? I mean, and until I was entirely humbled in my life and figured out that I was entirely lost in my own thought and my own mind, until then did I not realize how Christ was God. And those guys don't hold a candle to him. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we no longer do so. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. New creation. The old has gone, the new is here. Look, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've surrendered your life to him, you're a new creation. You're a new creation. You know, we always want to have this like start over, right? I'll move here and I'll start over. I'll graduate from college and I'll start over. I'll find a new relationship and I'll start over. You know what the problem with that is? You're still there. Mm -hmm. But when you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. You see, we couldn't reconcile, it's a big word, reconcile, we couldn't reconcile ourselves to Christ, to God, excuse me. God had to send Christ to do it for us. Make sure you understand that. There's no work you can do to reconcile yourself with God. What are you going to pay Him? What are you going to do for Him that He hasn't already done? What are you going to buy Him at Kohl's that He doesn't already have? That God was wrecking Himself to the world in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. Thank you, Lord. And that He has committed 
to us the message of reconciliation. Hey there, remnant, that's to you. He's committed to you the message of reconciliation. And if you think it's only done up here, you got another thing coming. It's done out there. It's done out there. The message of re reconciliation is done out there. It's not just the preaching of the word, it's the living of it out. Matter of fact, sometimes you might want to use words, but more importantly, live it out. And here's what Paul says. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us, the remnant, were His ambassadors. Now, I wouldn't do it this way. Why would God use such a ragtag bunch of ambassadors? I mean, Brian likes to say, if we're God's advertising, He needs to get new advertising, right? But He didn't do it that way. He chose to use us. He chose to use you. And you know what He wants you to do? He wants you to stand strong for Him. He wants you to drink water and vegetables. He wants you to represent Him when all the world says forget Him. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. And I want you to see yourself that way. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, see yourself as the righteousness of God. Not the low-down, dirty guy that you used to be or gal. Not the one you look in the mirror at every day and you go, ah, I'm frumpy. You are the righteousness of God. When you stand before God at the end of time, He's going to say, look at that. You're my righteousness. That's awesome. So I, you know, you had some questions for me why I went on, went on about this remnant. Hopefully I answered that because God's working through the remnant. You're part of the remnant. You're part of a long line of a remnant that God's working through. So I have one question for you. Where do you stand? Where do you stand today? Are you part of the remnant? Are you the part that's tucked in the hem of the garment? Protected, preserved, prospering? You only get there one way. You only get there one way. And that way is through Jesus Christ. For a second here, I don't want to dwell on it. What happens to the rest of the hairs? They're burned in the fire. They're driven by the sword. Death and destruction is all that's found. And those that are scattered into the wasteland. But a small part is tucked into the hem of the garment. You only get there one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. He came, lived a sinless life, preached, died on the cross for your sins. Beaten, bluttered, batty, battered. Awful death. He took the weight of the world, the sins of the entire world, on His back, took Him to the cross, died. And He defeated death. All for you. I called him earlier, he was the, the unblemished lamb. He was the great sacrifice for us. If you do not know him as your Lord and Savior, I implore you, I beseech you, I beg of you. Heck, you need to. You need to know him. Because only in knowing Jesus Christ are you tucked into the hem of the garment. Only do you become a remnant. Only are you preserved and prospered. And I don't mean prospered like you have a nice house with an ocean view. Sure, I'd like one of those. But you know what? You're prospered for all of eternity. You don't get cut up by the sword. You don't get burned in the fire. You get to spend all of eternity with Jesus Christ. Become part of the remnant. Become part of the remnant today. Lord, I want to thank you for Ezekiel. What a strange guy. Preach, preaching in many strange ways, using many great visions, Lord, but all to show us your plans, your prophecy, Lord, what you're going to do.
ought to show us that you have in mind a people, a people that you've called to yourself, that you've protected, that you've preserved, and that you're going to prosper, even despite all the things going on around us and around those that we've looked at today. And Lord, right now, there may be someone here who is far into this concept of a remnant that hasn't heard of who you are, it hasn't understood your protection and your preservation, Lord. And if that's you out there, Lord, if that's you out there, I want to ask that you join me in this prayer. It's not to me, it's not to this building, it's not to this church, it's not to a denomination, it's not to an organization. It's to God. It's to God who wants to protect and preserve you who's seeking you, who seeks you so much that he sent his only son to come and die for you. That you may live, that you may be alive spiritually and know him. And that you may have abundant life now and forever. And it goes something like this. Lord, I, I need you. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I... You know, I've tried to do things my own way for way too long. I've tried to work in the big and the bold and the beautiful, and I need you to work in the small things in my life. I need you to work out things in my life. So, Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Lord, today I commit myself. I surrender myself. I pledge allegiance of myself to you, the one true king my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. And Paul tells us if we do that, if we call on His name, we are saved. There's not a bunch of other stuff, by the way. That's it right there. Committing ourselves to Christ, to, to Christ is simple. Living out the life becomes a little more difficult. So if you've prayed that prayer, Lord, my prayer to you is that those that have prayed that, that you would strengthen them, that you would find bring other Christians, other believers in Christ around them to strengthen them, that they would find themselves in your word and in prayer and hearing from you day in and day out, and they, they would grow in boldness and grow in strength in your word, Lord. That's my prayer, that we would just, just have a convert that goes out and then gets afflicted by the world, Lord, but we would have someone who loves you, who knows you, and who is surrounded by others, Lord, of the remnant that want to preserve and protect and prosper. Lord, I thank you for what your word shows us all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the Old. It's the same book, the same message of your salvation, your reconciliation. Lord, you're an awesome and wonderful God. I ask these things all in Christ's name. Amen.